Gentlemen, my name is Nick D4VIS, and it's really been a while because uh, Toolbox Theory 3 has come out. Uh, I just wanted to put that into perspective. It took, I think, the last Toolbox Theory dropped maybe last November, last December. Uh, I think maybe one or two patches along the way. But I remember. Uh, toolbox theory coming out when I was still senior year of high school and now I'm sitting in New York in college uh, and you probably saw in my announcement I were switching the series to Hyperborea and one of the reasons I want to do that is because the smutta the like basically the regional conflict mechanic has a very 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 cool tree for the Aryan Brotherhood uh, and a lot of cool Hyperborean focus art in it. I also want to show the other Smutta trees for the other nations. Uh, I think every unifier but now the PRC and Father Men who had their content cut because they're getting reworked. Uh, makes playing the Far East a lot more fun. Uh, also I want to show some other changes on the map. You can see uh, Gottenland has been increased because Ukraine actually has real content. Well, not real content, real skeleton content now instead of just staying under a one Reich Commissar or flipping randomly to the Republic of Ukraine. Moscowine got a lot of cool new stuff. They have a dynamic collapse, you'll see. It's uh, pretty cool. Uh, let me see some other changes on the map. Uh, Diana is gone, now replaced by three different little nations. Colombia is in a civil war between New Granada, Colombian Revolutionary Union, and then the Republic of Colombia. I made a video on that, you guys should go watch that. Um, and then we also have here, Haiti in the Dominican Republic. Haiti under uh, Refilo Trujillo is going to have a very Bay of Pigs-like invasion coming from the north. Uh, let's also look, we have the Oriental Republic of Santa Cruz, basically a Paraguayan puppet state. Uh, and what actually happens, uh, I won't spoil it, but they actually, they play a pretty large role against Bolivia and the Paraguayan Revolution. Also, did I mention, you could probably hear in the background, the new track uh, for Free France. They got some more skeleton content, because the French state, you could also see Burgundy's a lot smaller. They Now, when the war begins, they reclaim their borders at the start of the game before uh, TT3. But we got a very small Burgundy right now, and so I think they did that so the Nord Paris and Sud Paris actually matters. Uh, but what I was saying was, um, when the French state collapse, uh, if Free France won the West African War, they can reclaim the mainland, I think. I haven't seen it happen, because, uh... I saw Free France fight the Cameroonian African state and just get in a Vietnam-like stalemate in uh, Yoruba land. Uh, also, speaking of that, they fixed the like the looping super event thing for the West African War. If you know, don't know what I'm talking about, it was the the West African Alliance versus the the Pan African Front. It was like it would play the same super event 20 times. So it'd be like, our independence, our independence, our independence. That's the first line of the thing. I also should say, as I'm like talking about it, Vorshilov is gone. Hold back your tears, guys. They did not prolong his life. Well, actually, I don't know where he went. You can also see uh, your old military district instead of Sverdolovsk. Uh, Siberian Black League instead of Omsk. West Siberian People's Republic instead of Toymen. I probably butchered that. <laughs> and also, uh, no more West Mongolia for Russian unifiers, I think. Uh, but let's get into the game as the Aryan Brotherhood. I'll make a pause and I'll see you guys there. Okay, as we get into the game, you can see we have a new mod screen. We have the Russian Psyche. Uh, basically, I think this was the the like the previous description now broken up into little chunks like this makes it a lot more easy to read you can also see mod info cold war proxy wars cold war interface nuclear warfare 
Uh, the economy, laws and social development, country specific mechanics, and then mod development, and this is just like the credits and stuff. But we are playing as the Aryan Brotherhood. You can, I can already see we start with a, a bit more manpower than I remember, which is pretty good. Means we're able to make a lot more what I call berserker divisions. I always play, I always make those when I uh, play the Aryan Brotherhood. They're just elite infantry with uh, artillery. Because, remember, our army sucks ass. <laughs> and so, we, we if, in order not to get stomped by Vietka, which I'm going to just say is the, like, the number one run killer. Like, once I'm through Vietka, everything else is fine. Like, I can beat West Russian Revolution front easy. Samara goes down usually without a fight. But Vietka, especially since, um, God, what was, not, actually it was Toolbox there. Since toolbox that got released, the Aryan Brotherhood got a lot harder, <laughs> and, but I had still been able to do it, like, without cheesing, and I just got reminded of my, by myself, tech trees, the Russian warlords, the West Russian, uh, West Siberian, fuck, West Russian, West Siberian, Central Siberian, and Far Eastern warlords all have their own distinct, uh, tech trees, uh, since this is not really, like, a like, uh, this is more just an introductory episode. I'll show the West Russian, then I'll tab over to, uh, West, West Siberian, Central Siberian, and Far Eastern to show you guys the different tech trees. Let's see the West Russian tech tree. Looks, uh, you can see little differences, but the West Russian tech tree was sort of used as, like, the, the model. You can see, like, the AK-47, obviously the PPS-43 uh, instead of the PPS uh, H, uh, you could see little differences, like, look at that, main battle tanks, and, cause we're the Aryan Brotherhood, look at this, they got runes on it, that is very, very cool, you can see a swastika, different runes, hmm, let's see if, uh, yeah, I think only the T-34 has that kind of art, I really, hmm, I wish, uh, like, the T-54 had runes on it, too. That's pretty cool. Let's see, uh, light planes. Um, I think, like, besides from these starting ones, it's still basically the same. Artillery, different artillery. Support. Actually, no. Uh, you can see we also have support weapon systems. Kits. Uh, I think those don't really change between, um... Oh, yeah, yeah, makeshift infantry kit. Look at that. It has runes on it. That is that is pretty cool. That that is, I like that a lot. Because uh, it... Oh, and look at that. Our trucks have runes on them, too. That is pretty cool. It's like a... It's like a little, like, stationary van, but with runes. Runes on it. Okay, that, that is very cool. Uh, so I'm gonna... I'm gonna tab over to... Let's see. Let's go Omsk. And I'll, I'll make a pause, and I'll see you guys then. Okay, we're on Omsk. Let's see their tech tree. Um, you can see already little differences. Um, makeshift infantry kit doesn't have the unique art like we have. Uh, their trucks are different. Let's see their tanks. You sh yeah, look at that already. T-44 versus the T-43. Uh, T-55. There's just like, it's... They're, they're still Russian warlords, end of the day, but there's little differences because regionally... It's, uh, it's a little hard to share information when you're in a warlord, period. Let's also, now, let's now go to Novosibirsk, and I'll see you guys there. Okay, welcome to the heart of Siberia, and let's see their tech tree. And you can see, um, AK, AV-50 versus an AK-47. And you can see Mosin Nagant and STV-40. Anti-tank weapons already a, like a little difference mainly just these as I said the intro ones trucks you can see minor differences in just the names light aircraft still basically the same but with uh, different routes as you can see artillery same as uh, West Siberia now let's go to the Far East and I'll show Irkutsk and Amur and Magadan just this sh because Amur, Magadan, Cheetah have uh, you can see it's uh, Little differences because they're the different heirs of Arban. Okay, welcome to the Paris of Siberia, <laughs> Irkutsk. Uh, let's see their tech tree. 
Um, already you can see different artillery, I don't know why it defaults to the artillery screen. And oh, look at this, OSA-45, AR-53, ARM. The reason I'm pointing this out is because you're about to see when we switch over to the Heirs of Arban, they have a sort of different tech tree. You can also see tanks, fighting vehicles. This is more like derived from Soviet equipment. You'll, I'll, I'll actually, let's go through all three Heirs of Arban, because uh, the first game I played in TT3 was Umber, as you guys could probably guess. So let's tag over to Cheetah. Okay, we're on Cheetah. Now let's see their tech trees. I want you guys to take notes of any little differences. First of all, I think the Heirs of Arban, they all use uh, uh, Japanese-inspired vehicles because they did come from Harbin, which is uh, under the Empire of Manchukuo. Uh, but you can see uh, Japanese-inspired, Japanese and Russian fusion as you get down here, like T-63A. Let's also now go to infantry. You can see Simnayov uh, after the uh, Grigory Simnayov. And you'll see once we switch over to Amur and uh, Magadan, they have their own like special flavor for these. So I'm going to tag over to Amur now and I'll show you guys. And then we'll go to Magadan right after that. Okay, we're in my favorite warlord in the Far East. And now let's see their uh, equipment. You can see Rod Zaveski, Automat. And besides from that, not meant much other differences, I think. Let's see if tank's a little different. Uh, yeah, they still use, like, uh, the fusion of Japanese and Russian equipment, because these guys were all supplied by the Japanese, so makes sense they're going to use uh, Japanese equipment. Now let's go over to Magadan. Okay, we're in the port of Siberia, and let's see Magadan. I, I actually haven't checked their tech tree out, so I know that... They have, oh yeah, yeah, here we go. They actually use American equipment, like uh, Pershings, uh, Clarks. That's actually pretty cool. I, I did not, like, check that, but you can still see, like, uh, these three are, the, these three onward are the same, but you can use American equipment because you're getting lend leased by the United States. You can also see Matkowski, Automat, and M1 Garands. That's pretty cool. Uh, light aircraft, they're using American aircraft. Uh, artillery, uh, American artillery. But anyway, let's go back to the Aryan Brotherhood. When I uh, I'm when I play them, I'm not gonna read out every event because I've played. Well, when I say an every event, I mean like the intro tree and stuff. Because I played the Aryan Brotherhood, I played Hyperborea, I played it in two separate series. First, The North Awakens, and then uh, Rise of the Reich. Two very good series. Go check it out. But this is gonna be a Hyperborea series, but until we really get to the second smutta, I'll be doing cursory, like, unpausing just to show you stuff we're doing and stuff we're uh, getting done. And I also just realized I forgot to tell you guys, America got a lot of changes too. So I'm going to tag over to the Aryan Brotherhood and then I'll do some more explaining just so I don't, like, accidentally unpause while playing as Megadan. Okay, welcome back to Perm. Uh, and you can see how much changes because we didn't unpause. So let's look in America, they have a, well actually we'll see it throughout the game, but you can see American Malays, they have a new like uh, thing for that. Jim Crow's got a new uh, focus icon, and then we have uh, Richard Nixon with the silent conservatism. I don't know if this was in uh, the last update where it was just added, but I'll read it. In a world of unchecked radicalism and tyranny, America requires a steady conservative hand to steer the nation from destruction. To this end, Richard Milhouse Nixon has developed a unique strand of American conservatism, conservatism in order to ensure the prosperity and stability of the United States in the face of constant internal and external threats. Taking its name from the Nixon's appeal to the so-called silent majority in American politics, silent conservatism com combines the interests of pro-Republican Party business groups and culturally conservative voters and the Democratic Party to create a cautious, pragmatic approach to solving the economic and social issues within the country. While primarily conservative in nature, silent conservatism se seeks to create a moderate alternative to what was seen as naive, um, 
naive liberals and heartless reactionaries who threaten domestic politics, rejecting radicalism from both sides of the political spectrum. Its proponents instead attempt to appeal to the vast sea of voting blocks in America through broadly populist rhetoric, flexible reforms, and paternalistic attitude towards the nation's citizens. Owing in a large part to Nixon's own pragmatism, silent conservatism often hesitates when taking any stronger positions on political issues, instead preferring to stick to a middle ground that largely follows the majority opinion of any particular subject. While most, uh, mostly successful so far in ensuring the stability of the deeply divided Republican-Democratic coalition, time will tell whether or not Nixon's approach to politics can continue to walk the tightrope between the increasingly divisive issues that plague the nation. I should also mention the domestic discontent for the South African War I think has been removed because why would the American public have any opposition to fighting literal Nazi colonies in Africa? And instead, uh, from my observations, it has been shifted to the West African War. There's a modifier that they'll get. We'll probably check on them later when the West African War begins, which shows um, domestic discontent over intervention in Africa. And so I think that's just a lot better of a fix. Um, but let's get back here. We are the Aryan Brotherhood, as everyone knows and loves. Um, also, the general system has been changed around, so instead of uh, 24 divisions, we command 12 each, so it's like little strike groups. And now let's get researching some technology. We're going to do post-war combat support equipment uh, to get that recovery rate, and then we'll start working on our computers. And let's start with the first focus, Beneath the ho Hooked Cross. Remember, as I said, go watch my other series if you want to see it. Um, I'm not really going to do any really reading. We're also going to slash any civilian factories. And uh, I'll see you guys once we're uh, once we get our first event, because I also want to give time for production to kick up. Because we can make a pretty ludicrous amount of guns every day, and I want to show you guys. So I'll see you guys then. Okay, we completed Beneath the Hooked Cross, and now we're going to do a City on War footing. I always do a City War footing, work for your bread and labor for your nation, just to get rid of this abysmal poverty tick and also help get our industrial base a little better. We're also going to now scavenge for loot. Um, the number one thing when playing the Aryan Brotherhood is we need to get external investments straight away. Because $415 million of debt compared to a $474 million GDP means if we don't, uh, if we don't save our money or like, if we, if we don't get that external investment, we're going to get a fiscal crisis and we're going to quickly go to 100% poverty, which really, really sucks. So I'll make a pause and I'll see you guys once we get a city on a war footing or we get the Beneath the Hooked Cross event. Okay, we got Beneath the Hook at Cross. As he was led to the ceremony room, Dmitry Polichov tried to calm his racing thoughts. It called her wisdom for the doctrine, the mind had a hierarchy of thoughts, just as the body had a hierarchy of blood. Fear, doubt, and anxiety were the blood patterns of vermin. Aryan thought only of strength and courage, violence, and conquest. Never nervousness was a vestige of the inferiority he would soon leave behind. And if it felt like an eternity, he reached the end of the long corridor and entered the Grand Hall. Aryans, member of the organization, sat in horseshoes surrounding the center of the room. Uh, with a cloaked high ranked a member of an, on an elevated seat in the center. Dmitri dropped to his knees instinctively. Initiate Polochov, rise. The hooded figure spoke in a soft voice and it nevertheless carried throughout the chamber. He obeyed, attempting to mimic the dignified figure of a Nordic ideal as he stood. <laughs> God, that's just, I think of like the Virgin versus Chad Walk. Like, uh, the Nordic ideal of standing up. Uh, you performed admirably in the trial, served with unflinching loyalty and duties of all of the initiate. You have sworn the oaths to the folk, Reich, and Fuhrer. You have proven yourself as the one among the elect. Revel in the worthiness of your blood, Matthias Gertzfeld. Welcome to the Aryan Brotherhood. The seated members clapped politely as Matthias received the proof of superiority, a, a swastika pin, which he proudly attached to his lapel, his haughty posture, and an affection 
affectation only a few minutes before was now genuine. As he felt pride and hatred pervade him to the bone. He was part of a small elite class high above the million of vermin that filled Russia, and he would die before relinquishing that status. Uh, the Aaron Brotherhood gains another member, and only 30 political power, God damn it. Uh, thankfully, we get a good, pretty good political power tick per day. I'm used to playing on elite difficulty where you have like no political power. Uh, but I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys probably once we do work for bread and labor for a nation, and then we get started on reforming our military into something actually sort of decent. Because with all this free manpower, we're gonna we're gonna buff up these divisions. This is only about three thousand men, which is not enough. But I'll see you guys then. Okay, because we get a passive tick of army experience, I'm just going to now begin starting to reform this. We're going to add, I think we're going to try to make a 2x3 with the with some uh, support anti-tank. Not really like the best divisions on earth, but more just stuff to hold the line. Uh, maybe I could add an, an, like maybe one more down here, but I'll see how like how tight manpower is. Uh, but I'll see you guys, as I said, once we get uh, Labor for a Nation. All the while, as our manpower ticks up, I mean our army experience ticks up, I'm going to be reforming this division more and more, and I'm also soon going to be getting external investments. Okay, this is actually one of the new events that was added, because this is like the precursor to Europa Narbon content that's going to be added for Moss Queen, with the Liptesk prison breakout. Despite what little information the German Reich from the certain Moss Queen lets out of its borders, the news about its most recent failures in gov governance has been spread well beyond the borders of the Einheits Pact. Uh, Ivan Vorobon, a former Red Army soldier and German collaborator turned partisan, escaped from Moskowin's Libtesk prison, and a bold breakout stages uh, by unidentified forces. The broader Libtesk region, formerly a hotbed of resistance, has since experienced a dramatic rise in insurgent activity, many other regions reporting similar issues. Siegfried Kasch, the Reichskommissar in Moskowin, has already made several executive orders to quell the spread of disorder using his signature methods. Uh, Germanius refused to comment. Destiny's call is as loud as it can be. I think they get a modifier, but basically, there's a very, very, very present uh, motif, and well, I don't know motif, but it's like in all the Moscowine events, you could see destiny, destiny, uh, not destiny there, uh, but uh, destiny is like even in the Moscowine uh, like like disillusion events, they mention destiny. It's because I think like in in the context of the Moscowine, it's like a very anthropomorphized like thing. It, like, when you're the player playing the game, I think, by by that logic, you are destiny, you, because you're like the Volksgeist of the nation. Like, um, I'm not playing as Gutram Wagner, I'm not playing as any one of the soldiers, I'm playing as the nation itself. Well, I think that's more like, well, because, none of, like, he's not, he doesn't want to go hyperbore, he wants, like, Rise of the Reich and stuff. But I'm playing as, like, the spirit of the nation guiding it. There's a little paradox deep thoughts for you. And I'll see you guys uh, once we get this stuff done. Okay, we completed labor for your nation. Now we're going to do instilling fear and then reform our raiders. And then we'll start bolstering our ranks and we'll get a warrior cast. Because we're already swimming in manpower and by the time we use that... We're, we're gonna be uh, pretty fine, so the manpower malice won't really hurt us. But what definitely is good is getting our combat ability up. So let's instill some fear. We'll then reform our raiders, and I'll see you guys once we're ready to start on a warrior cast. And I think that'll be the end for today's episode. Okay, I know I said we'll resume once we get a warrior cast, but this is one of the new things added. Uh, Australian Prime Ministers, and they can actually get a nuke, but Arthur Cal Caldwell becomes Prime Minister of Australia. It appears that there is a new wind blowing through Australia, but not quite as new as one would think. The Australian Labour Party has triumphed over once more at the polls, despite their scandal two months prior, and an insider party scheming politic has led to an old guard Canada on the right wing of the ALP. Arthur Caldwell has claimed victory in the recent snap election in Australia, 
While the powers of the world eye up Caldwell's still unclear intentions abroad, that stands with sharp contrast to his policies at home, arguing for nothing less than full liberties to the labor unions that make up the vast industries of Oceania, and the unflinching preservation of white Australia, Caldwell will use everything in his arsenal, including his characteristically silver tongue, to move the members of parliament to voting yes for his measures. Yes, there is a new wind blowing through Australia, and the wind calls for the downtrodden and dispossessed in society. A socialist who supports the white Australia policy, if you don't know what Australia banned uh, Asian immigration and other types of immigration to Australia, basically, um, if you're, if you're, um, I'm, I'm just going to read the last line of this and then we'll finish up. Uh, the Prime Minister grins and rasps to his comrades, Two Wongs do not make a white. Uh, I'll leave you guys with that. I'm Nick D4VIS. I'm glad to be making videos again. I'll see you guys next time.